All right. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you for joining me today for today's webinar. Today's webinar is five SolidWorks tips you may never have seen before. My name is Mark Downey. <clears throat> I'm an application engineer with Desai Solutions. And I've picked five topics that I think are kind of unique to SolidWorks that maybe you haven't seen before. And uh, I'd like to share those with you today and uh, maybe you'll learn something new. So uh, let's get started. First, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a mechanical engineer. I've been doing this for 31 years. I've got experience in aerospace, automotive, plastic injection molding, extrusion, consumer products. Um, I started using SOLIDWORKS in 1997. Um, I uh, started with Desai Solutions in 2018. Since I've started with them, I've earned uh, several certifications, including CSWE and uh, my CPPA. Uh, in my spare time, my wife and I are in the process of restoring a farm, a family farm, uh, here in Northwest Missouri. So what I'd like to do now is get a little bit more information about you all. I've got a couple of quick polls, <clears throat> so let me bring those up. The first poll that I've got is to find out how long you've been using SOLIDWORKS. So I'm going to launch that poll give everybody a chance to uh, take a look and um, answer that for me. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your participation. Keep that going here for a minute. Great. Terrific. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and close that one out. I got a good, good, good little uh, experience there. All right, so let's um, switch back over to um, the next version. I want to know what version of SOLIDWORKS are you currently using? Um, I'm going to be displaying the presentation today. Uh, let, me, let me launch that one. There we go. Uh, I'm going to be um, displaying today in SOLIDWORKS 2019, Service Pack 2. Okay, it looks like most of you are using SOLIDWORKS 2019 so far. Great. So we got a few in 2018 and all the way back to 2017, 2016, great, terrific. Thank you very much for your input. I appreciate that. So let's take a look at what we're going to do. Um, did the poll on SOLIDWORKS? Did the poll on which version? So let's take a look at today's topics. The first topic I'm going to look at is Z-axis up template. This is a template um, where people, in some cases, you need the Z-axis oriented upward. In default SOLIDWORKS setup, um, the axis is oriented in the Y direction, and there's currently no way to change that. I'm going to show you how to set up a template with the Z-axis up. The next thing I want to look at is an import option called 3D Interconnect. This allows you to bring in proprietary CAD files right into SOLIDWORKS and be able to use them in SOLIDWORKS. The next thing we'll take a look at is a selection feature that uses, you can select a partial loop. This um, gives you the ability to use edges to create sketch geometry too. The next thing we'll look at is an extrude option that you may have seen before but didn't know what it was about, and um, we'll delve into some of that a little bit with extrude. And the last thing we'll take a look at is the isolate tool. This is useful in assemblies and parts to be able to um, take a look at, uh, focus in on some models. Um, if you would, if you've got any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and feel free to populate those questions in uh, the question box. I'll take a look at those at the end and, uh, and answer any questions that I can. So let's start with Z-axis up. As I mentioned, Z-axis up is used, or it can be used for cases where somebody's using machining, um, if they're doing CNC or in the automotive world. So let me switch over to SOLIDWORKS. I'm going to demonstrate what I'm talking about there. I'm going to start up a new part file. And I'm going to show the default planes in SOLIDWORKS. The front plane, the top plane, the right plane. And you notice down here in the bottom of the screen, you can see the z-axis is oriented kind of towards the front of the model, the y-axis oriented up. So what happens now, if I start a sketch on the right plane, let's click the right plane and we'll start a sketch. 
we rotate around, we can see that the horizontal axis shown by the short red arrow or in the origin is oriented in the negative Z direction and the vertical axis is oriented in the positive Y. What I want to do is set this up to where that vertical axis is always pointed in the Z direction. So let's exit out of the sketch. I'm going to start looking normal to the right plane. In the right plane, we can see that z-axis is oriented to the left. And I want this set up to where the z-axis is oriented vertically. So I'm going to press the Alt key down. I'm going to arrow key to get this oriented vertically. Now I want to set up a plane to use for reference. So I'm going to go to my plane function. I'm going to expand the feature manager, and I'm going to click the origin as the first reference point. Then I'm going to use create plane parallel to screen. That's going to orient, that's going to create a plane that is normal to the screen and oriented um, in the right direction I want. So now I want to go ahead and rename that. Let's rename this to the YZ plane. And I'm going to hide that right plane for a moment. Now if I start a sketch on that YZ plane, and I rotate around, notice that the horizontal axis is along the Y axis, and the vertical now is along the Z. So that's what I want for that model. So let's go ahead and create the rest of these planes. I'm going to click the, the front plane, and I'm going to do normal to that front plane. This would be normally looking down onto my CNC table, if you will, with the X being to the right and the Y being back. So I'm going to set up a plane using the same function again. I'm going to go up to plane. I'm going to click on the origin, and I'm going to click on plane parallel to the screen. I'm going to name this the XY plane. You can type XY plane. I'm going to hide that front plane. One more plane is the top plane. I'm going to click on the top plane and click normal to. Notice when I did that, that it oriented the z-axis down. If I click the top plane and click normal to again, it's going to toggle that direction up. And now I want to create a plane that's in this orientation. So again, I'll click on plane. Oh, I want to clear the selections though. Let's clear selections. I'm going to click on plane, expand the feature tree, and click on the origin. And I'm going to use parallel to the screen again and click OK. And I'm going to name this the XZ plane. And we'll hide that top plane. So now you can see that I've got these planes set up in the directions that I want. If I click on the YZ plane and start a sketch with that plane, You'll see that the Z is oriented upwards in my model. I've got a vertical axis that's oriented along the Z and a horizontal along the Y. Likewise, if I start with the XZ plane, a sketch there, rotate around a little bit, you can see, again, the vertical axis oriented along the Z and the horizontal along the X. So um, now what I want to do is set up the views to where my XZ plane is going to be my front view. So I'm going to bring up, press the space bar to bring up the view orientation window. Oh, before I do that, let's click on the XZ plane and we'll click normal to it. SolidWorks is saying that this is the bottom view, but I want this to be my front view. So I'm going to bring up the space bar. I'm going to use the update standard views and I'm telling SolidWorks I want this to be my front view. It's going to change the standard views. We're going to say yes to that. So now when I click the isometric view, my, I've got an isometric view with the orientation the way I would expect it. The last thing I might want to do here would be to set up the scenes so that when I uh, are looking at this model, the, the, the XY plane is the bottom view of the plane. So now when I go to isometric view, and if I create any models, the bottom view will be there. Um, one other thing you might want to do is this, is use the freeze option to lock these settings down so that these things don't get changed when you bring up your template. The freeze bar is an option in the settings. You go to options, 
search for freeze, enable the freeze bar, it's under general, so it's an option right here to turn the freeze bar on. What that does is anything that's above the freeze bar in the feature tree does not get rebuilt when the model is rebuilt. Um, so then the last thing to do would be to go ahead and save this as a template. So we'll go to File, Save As. We'll select our part template. And I'm going to call this my Z axis up. And since I'm in inches, I'm going to save it in inches. So now I've got a template ready to go. All I have to do to use it is create a new part, Z axis up and I've got my part ready to go. Cool. So I hope that's useful for anybody who might need to have that functionality. Again, this template's set up and ready to go, and uh, we can build our models with the z-axis oriented upwards. Let's switch back over to our presentation. That's the z-axis up. 3D interconnect. 3D interconnect is an import option it's found under System Options, Import, and Enable 3D Interconnect. This allows me to open and bring into SOLIDWORKS 3D files that are created in other CAD packages like CATIA or Inventor or Pro-E or NX. It, let's take a look at bringing a file into an assembly file. So we'll switch back over to SOLIDWORKS. And let's go, um, again, look at the, where this option is located. It's under System Options, Import, Enable 3D Interconnect. With this turned off, let's turn it off first and let's take a look. I'm going to try to open a file, and we're going to go to where I've got some CATIA sample files. And I'm going to try to open a CATIA file. When I click Open, SOLIDWORKS says it can't obtain the license for the translation. That's what that 3D Interconnect is for. So we're going to go back to Options again. We're going to click on Import and Enable 3D Interconnect. I guess I should pause and see. I'm assuming everybody's got visibility of my screen. Great. Okay. So um, with that turned back on, I'm going to start a new assembly. And I'm going to go down here and I'm going to click on CATIA parts. I'm going to open a CATIA part. SOLIDWORKS is going to read that model in now that I've got 3D Interconnect turned on. And I'm going to go ahead and place that part at the origin. You'll see over here in the feature tree that the icon has a green arrow on it. That indicates that this has an external reference. I'll expand this. We can take a look down here at the bottom, and we can see, again, this part has been inserted, and it has an external reference to that CATIA file. I can insert CATIA, Pro-E, and I can do multiple formats in this as well. So let's go up and import another model. This time I'm going to pick an inventor file. I'm going to navigate out to where I've got my sample inventor files. And let's pick this part here, and we'll drop that in the assembly. And we'll go out and grab one more part just to show we'll bring in a, a Pro-E sample file, bring in a Pro-E file here. We'll switch over to Pro-E, we'll pick this tailstock part. So you can see I built an assembly now all out of proprietary CAD models, and I can use these models to create references and mate, so I can mate these two together, I can go over here and mate these with concentric, and build my assembly using non-native CAD files. Hope that's useful for somebody out there. Um, now, what I'm going to show you here is I've, I've brought these CATIA files in, or these sample files in. Now, maybe the supplier has made a change to the part, and I need to bring in a new version. I can go over here and click on the part. Let's, let's, first, let's save the assembly. Now that I've got the assembly saved, if I want to go in, if I get a new part file from a vendor, I can click on the part in the feature tree, and I can click on Edit Part. 
this brings up a dialog box where I can go in and navigate to another part. I'm just going to click another CATIA part, click open, and accept that change. SOLIDWORKS will reload that new part in place of the original part. So now obviously this part is a little different than the original part, but I was able to bring in that part file and maintain you know, the, the assembly with that part file. So that's how 3D Interconnect works with an assembly file. 3D Interconnect will also work with part files. So, I mean, as far as bringing in a part file. So let's take a look at what that means when I'm talking about bringing in a part file. So let's close out this assembly. I'm going to open a part file this time. Again, using 3D Interconnect, it's going to bring that file in. Um, it's prompting me to do import diagnostics. I'm going to say no to that at this point. Again, notice over here in the feature tree that this part has an external reference. And it, when I read that in, it brought in the solid body and it brought in some planes. I can go in and add features to this and make changes to it. But I can also, maybe I don't want it linked to the original part. I can break that link by right-clicking on the file and clicking break link. This is an undoable process, so we'll go ahead and click yes, break the link. And now I've imported that in. Now, without 3D Interconnect turned on, I wouldn't have been able to brought in this CATIA file. Well, now that I've brought in a CATIA file, I've converted it to a SOLIDWORKS file, and um, I can add features to it and make changes to it. So that's how 3D Interconnect works. I hope that's useful. So now I'm going to take over and take a, take a look at select partial loop. Partial loop is useful for controlling where you start and end as loop selection. And I'm going to use this model that I just opened up to demonstrate. Let's say, for example, that this sheet metal looking part, uh, I want to bring these cutouts to the other side of this flange. So I'm going to start a sketch on that flange. And I could go ahead and select this face and obviously do convert edges. And that gives me you know, a conversion of that. But I don't want this, all this extra geometry to deal with. So what I want to do is I'm going to use select partial to select that loop. I'm going to start over here on this edge. And I want to end over on this edge over here on the corner. If I press the control key down and the right mouse button, I get the option to select partial loop. That selects from the start to the end. Now, how did I tell it to start? You know, why didn't it go the other direction? Well, that depends on where you select the end point. So I'm going to start again the selection. I'm going to click over here on the start edge. When I go over here now, it's where you click on this edge above the midpoint. So if I go up towards the top and I right click with the control key and select partial, see how now it goes around the outside instead of on the inside. So that's how select partial works. Again, Clicking on the start line, I'm going to go over here and left click on the select partial loop, right click, excuse me, select partial loop, and then convert edges. Now I've got those edges over here. I can take that. We can modify this. We can bring these edges up here. We can revert this geometry. I want to get rid of that relationship that it created right there. We'll bring this up. Use my S key to bring up my shortcut menu. We'll sketch a line across here to close off this profile. Let's do an extruded cut with that. So we'll go over to features, extruded cut. We'll say up to uh, next. And we've got that extruded cut brought in using that select partial. Now let's just go one step further with this. We can see that this was an imported file. Let's go ahead and toggle over to our sheet metal features. We'll click this face as being our stationary face. We'll do convert to sheet metal. We'll collect all of our bins. And with just a couple of mouse clicks, I've now got a sheet metal part from an imported file that I can flatten out. I think that's pretty cool. I hope everybody picked them something up there a little bit. All right. Let's jump back over to our presentation. Extrude from options. You may have seen this in the menu before in the feature manager and didn't know what it was for. Maybe you haven't used it. Maybe you didn't know what it was used for. Let's take a look at this. So I created this little sample file here um, with a, a little clevis looking part. And uh, I've got a rib feature in the middle. Now, obviously, I could create that using the rib tool on a plane. 
What I want to demonstrate here is how this works with the extrude options. I'm going to click on edit sketch plane to show you that the sketch plane that was used was this other side of the part. Let's take a look at the, um, the, the planes that I've got set up in the model. So we can see we've got the right plane on the, the side of the part, front plane in the middle, and the top plane down on the bottom. So I didn't really have a plane to start from. So I sketched on this other surface, and I'm going to show you now by editing the feature what this I'm talking about. Up here at the top is a from box. By default, SolidWorks always opens this up in sketch plane, and it, it sketches, it, it extrudes from the sketch plane that, you're, that you've started on. And then obviously you can see in this case how the, the rib feature would uh, go mid-plane from what we've selected there. The other options here are select surface or face. I could click this face over here and I could start, even though the sketch is over here, it's going to do the extrusion over on this face. I can also go down here and select vertex. I can click a vertex to use that as well. Or in this case, I used offset. Offset, since this part was four inches wide, I did a two-inch offset with a mid-plane extrusion. So that's how the offset works in the, the uh, extrude from function works. Let's take another take a look at another example. So you've got a surface that you started with and you want to create an extrusion from this. I'm going to start a sketch on the top plane and let's rotate around where we can see the top plane. Uh, let's grab a slot tool and we'll grab we'll create this uh, profile out here just to give us something to extrude from now i could go over here and i could extrude this up and let's grab the arrow and let's move it up here let's say let's set it up to about 12 inches snap it to 12 inches click ok and i could use the cut with surface and click on the surface let's toggle the arrow to the other side and click ok and we've got a cut surface. Now that's created an extra extra feature in my feature tree. Let's look at how we can do that without using the cut surface. So I'm going to delete the cut surface feature. I'm going to edit the extrude and this time I'm going to use the extrude from option to do an offset. I'm going to set it to 12 inches. You can see where it previews where it's going to start the extrusion from. I'm going to go over here and select up to surface, select the surface for reference, and now, instead of having a, an extra feature in the tree, I've been able to extrude that up to that surface and generate the geometry I'm looking for. Let's take a look at one more example. This time I've got a reducer type model. I want to create a mounting boss on the other side of this extrusion. Let's take a look at the reference planes we've got, the default reference planes. We've got our right plane our top plane and our front plane oriented like this. I'm going to start with the sketch on the right plane and let's uh, let's draw a center line. We'll come down from the center of the circle. Let's uh, and then we'll uh, throw a circle on the end of that. Let's uh, dimension the circle to three inches. Let's bring up the shortcut menu and dimension this to be 12 inches from the center. And now I want to use my extrude options. So we'll click over to Features, Extrude, and I'm going to do the offset function again. Let's set this to 26. You can see where that's going to bring it back here on the back side. We're going to click up to surface, rotate around, click on the surface. And there we've got our mounting boss added to our reducer profile using the offset feature with the Extrude. So a couple of uses for that. Um, hopefully that will you know, open some eyes and give you some ideas on what, how you can do that a little bit. Hopefully that's useful to you. The last thing I want to show you is the isolate function. The isolate function is used to set the visibility of hidden or transparent, uh, set the visibility to hidden, transparent, or wireframe of components that you uh, are not selected. It lets you focus on, select, on specific components. Um, it can be used in multi-body parts, like a, uh, like a weldment. It's very useful, of course, in assemblies. And it's really a quick way to create display states. So let me demonstrate what I'm talking about with this movable step assembly. Let's say, for example, that I want to focus in on the wheel on this model. 
you, you know, if you can, you can imagine if you've got a very complex assembly where you've got a lot of parts, this gives you the ability to go in and select multiple components. I'm going to just click the wheel and I'm going to click isolate. That isolates the wheel to and hides everything else. Now there's some options up here under the isolate toolbar. I can go to wireframe. Maybe I want to show the wheel with the wireframe option turned on. I can change it to be transparent so the other items are transparent. Or in this case, I want to select hidden. And once I've got the wheel hidden, I can focus in on that. I can create a display state. Display states are something that I, you know, I, I, it took me some time to get used to those, but they're really pretty handy when um, working with models and assemblies. What it does is it gives you an option to show this item on the configuration tree without having an extra configuration. So I'm going to exit to isolate. It brings the model back. I'm going to switch over to the Configuration Manager, and you can see down here at the bottom, I've got two display states now. I've got the wheel display state and the full assembly display state. Where this is useful now is in the drawing. Let's take a look at, let's, let's pull up a drawing for this and make a drawing from the assembly. We've got one started already. And um, I want to drop a view of that wheel into my model. Maybe it's a common part that I want to have in my assembly drawing. So I'm going to start a new drawing, new, new drawing sheet. I'm going to insert, and notice I'm, on, I'm just going to click on the assembly model, and I can go down here and click the display states. I'm going to click on the wheel display state. Um, let's set the scale for that to be one to one, and I want to do a right view, and I dropped the view of that wheel in there now. This this wheel now there's there's a view of that in from the assembly, but it's not creating an external reference to the component file. If you've got a common component where you're using it in multiple assemblies, if you were to do a view of that component outside of the assembly in every model, and then you try to do a pack and go on the component, it's going to go grab every assembly that you created an external reference to uh, when you do the pack and go. Using display states like this gets you around that. Now if you do a pack and go, you won't get that all those extra files. Um, you can do a, I don't have extra references to show that, but when you do a find references on this, you can see the move, uh, the, the, the drawing only has one reference to the assembly itself. So this is a good way to create external views of your components in a drawing and not have all those external references. So let's um, jump back over to our presentation, or um, excuse me, back to the part file. Notice this is a weldment. So let's open up this weldment file. Let's look at the feature tree, and we can see over here in the cut list all of these components. And maybe I want to focus in on one of these components, or for the drawing, I want to have a, uh, a drawing of just certain components. So I can right-click, isolate to that model, and I can create a... display state for support to, and now on my configuration tree I've got the full weldment or I've got the support to, and I can make drawings based on those display states and make it without having to create extra configurations. The more configurations you have, the more it's going to take SOLIDWORKS to calculate. So this gives you ability to do that without having all those extra configurations just using display states. So I hope that's useful. So that's what I have to present today. I hope everybody uh, was uh, enjoyed that. I'd like to bring up one more poll to wrap up the, the presentation, and that would be to find out what you think or what you like most. So um, just let me know what uh, what tip you think was uh, best for you and uh, which you might have uh, not known before. I appreciate everybody's feedback. Let's see here. Looks like isolate with something and select partial loop. Those were good ones. See access up template not so much, but not too bad. Great. Well, thank you everybody for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the uh, presentation. And um, you will be getting an email from me um, that has some, uh, or just a request for more information and feedback. If you could uh, 
reply back to that, it'd be great. Let's take a look and see if we've got any questions that I could answer for you. Uh, let's see here. open up my question box here and see if I've got any questions I can answer. In SOLIDWORKS 2019, I'm trying to get this here, hang on one second. Let's pop this out and take a look at it. So the first question I've got here, can you use the same, let's, let's uh, share my camera in case anybody's interested in taking a look at it here. Um, can you, sh can you do the same for drawings through 3D Connect? I'm not sure about that one, Andy. I'll have to look into that one. Very cool. Thank you. Love the option. Nice, nice. Late to the party. Will this presentation be available soon? Um, I, there will be a recording for this on our Decide website. You can get to that one as well. SolidWorks 2019 run on earlier Windows versions or only on Windows 10. 2019 can run on Windows 7. Uh, 2020 will be um, the last version that will run on Windows 7, by the way, so you'll want to look at upgrading that. We'd love to get a link to the video presentation. There will be a link to that uh, in the, uh, as well. Let's see. Can that file be shared to viewers the access up? Um, we'll see about putting that out there to, uh, to share that uh, template file. I can, it should be not a problem. If you, uh, in fact, if you want that, um, if you send the email back to me, I can send you back a copy of that template file. Let's see. Can I get a copy? Yes. Send me an email. We'll send you a copy of that. Will the webinar be downloadable? Yes, it will be. Great. I think that answers all the questions I can see at the moment. Great. Well, again, Email me. Uh, you will get an email from me. Um, uh, it will look personal for me and be personal for me. And uh, reply back to that. If you've got any other questions, I'll be happy to answer those. And um, thank you again for joining me. I really appreciate your, uh, your attendance today. Everybody have a great day.